I realize there are unique, outrageous acts of love that can be committed by me and me alone, and that is the unique purpose, obligation, joy, and responsibility. It's my ability to respond to reality. That's my outrageous act of love. A planetary awakening in love through a unique self-symphony. What a privilege it is to be part of this global community. There's a voice within me that asks, who am I, right? Who am I in all of this? Each and every one of us has a unique gift to give that we desperately need. Welcome to the heart of the revolution, everyone. It is with deep joy that we are together today in one mountain, many paths. Our mission is what Barbara Marks Hubbard and Dr. Mark Goffney call a planetary awakening in love through unique self symphonies. We are activating a new humanity and awakening as a new species. Homo Amor, the fulfillment of Homo sapiens. As a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, a zendo, no one is excluded, everyone is included, and we come together to attune to the evolutionary impulse awakening within us. Welcome home, everyone. I am Christina Tahal, the co-executive producer, along with Krista Josefa, Jamie Long, and Jacqueline Clark, and we are delighted to be together with each and every one of you for week 313th of our live community broadcast. What a privilege it is to be part of a global community where we contribute to humanity's flourishing. Use the Zoom and the Facebook chat functions to say hello, to let us know where you're from, and to express your prayers and to resonate the Dharma. On Zoom, do check that your chat settings say everyone so that we can all hear from you. Care to step deeper into community through the work and practice of creating the great Homo Amor Library. Reach out to Krista for the absolutely stunning opportunities. Her email is in the chat box now. Join us tomorrow, actually, writing to the evolutionary love codes. Every Monday we meet to alchemize the love code we are working with. Members do receive an email with the details. If you don't receive the email, I am personally inviting you to step closer in, to hold your center of this community, to deepen in contemplative practice and the evolutionary love code with you personally. What to expect today? First, a Dharma recap from myself, and then Dr. Mark will set our intention that we're working with. And then David will resonate the evolutionary love code. Then we step into our evolutionary sense making with Dr. Mark. And then we move into meditation to enter prayer. Finally, Krista invites us deeper into community. And to close, we bring people on for our goodbyes and a short dance party. I welcome all who are new. We need you. If this is your first time, these teachings do stand on their own and every week builds on the previous week. We do encourage you to listen to previous episodes. Today you will hear unique language. Trust the magic ways the Dharma comes through your understanding. One mountain, many paths, is radically committed to telling the new universe story. Now for my recap 
from last week's One Mountain Many Paths. Responding to the meta crisis through the erotic gnosis of tears. To respond to the meta crisis, we understand that crisis is an evolutionary driver and that every crisis at its core is a crisis of intimacy and that at the core of the global meta crisis is a global intimacy disorder. We are non-intimate with each other. We are split off from the deepest answers and the deepest responses to the core questions of our lives. Who are we? Where are we going? What's there to do? Every week, we're here to evolve, quite literally, to turn the wheel, to evolve the source code of consciousness and culture itself. This cosmoerotic dharma is a shared story of value that allows us to respond to global challenges based on the deepest reading of the leading edge wisdom streams of the pre-modern, modern, and post-modern world of gnosis, of knowledge. So, what does it mean to actually receive the esoteric, the deep? Not the surface teaching, but the profound inner teaching of the great traditions to actually listen to their voice and begin to integrate it in our lives. In the Hebrew lineage, the arousal of tears, the engagement with the language of tears, the ability to hear the voice of tears, to identify the revelation of tears, to let tears be our teacher, our master, participates in the process of evolution. Tears are understood to be erotic, an expression of the eros of cosmos itself. Are we willing to shed tears which wash away all of our old identity and to literally stand naked before the infinite, intimate, and to recreate ourselves from the very beginning? The human being does arouse the divine and brings the world into erotic union, into intimate union. Our personhood participates in the quality of personhood in cosmos. The perfected human being, that is to say the awakened human being, the high priest brings the feminine divine into heros gamos into erotic union with the masculine divine. When we bring together these qualities, the quality of our own fierce, unique autonomy and power together with communion, our desire to love, to participate with, to be part of, the desire to receive and be penetrated, and the desire to penetrate tenderness and fierceness when we bring those qualities together, the God and the goddess, then blessing can flow into the world. When they're split off from each other within ourselves, psychologically, spiritually, existentially, emotionally, reality collapses and our own personal reality collapses. Can we let go of the tyranny of all the yesterdays and actually find our unique voice? Can we let tears clarify the confusion? It's our capacity to cry, to engage in the great crying game of reality, to enter into the wail of tears, into tears of ecstasy, of union, of breakdown, of breakthrough, and of shattering of the old paradigms. Our capacity to cry authentically opens all the gates and actually arouses the healing, the tikkun, the fixing, the evolutionary transformation of all waters. There is not goodness, truth, or beauty without cultivating the gnosis of tears. 
Now I invite us to more deeply enter into the holy and sacred space of one mountain, many paths, and I turn my word to you, Dr. Markoff. Thank you so, so much, right? What a beautiful Dharma recapitulation, and it's a mad delight to be with everyone and to be here in this place and to be here together in one mountain, many paths, right? And in this seat of the revolution. And when we say the seat of the revolution, we don't mean it metaphorically. We mean it literally. We mean that at this moment, and let's find, let's find ourselves here. Who are we? And you have to just ask that question, who are we? And Christina resonated us into this place, this resonance of tears. And we're about the evolution of tears. Can you feel that with me? We're about the evolution of tears. And the evolution of tears means that I'm able to cry for more than I ever thought I could cry. I'm able to cry. I gain the capacity to cry tears of ecstasy for those I never thought I could cry for. I'm able to feel joy that's so much wider and so much bigger than any of the joys I thought I could feel. Can you feel that? Can you feel what it means to expand your field of the tears of joy? Right? I can actually feel joy. Who can feel that? Who can feel that? Right? I actually normally, right, as a normal separate self human being, right, I am able to cry a very narrow field of tears of joy, right? If I win the lottery, something particularly good happens, right? I start going out with a new person, right? I have a particular, I get a present, right? I maybe got some, you know, new insight if I'm particularly sensitive, right? So we cry tears of joy for a very, very narrow field. But when I actually wake up to my true identity, when I actually move from becoming merely a separate self, from being a homo sapien who's lost in the wisdom of separation, and I become not homo sapien, I become, I cross to the other side. I cross to the other side. I become the new human and the new humanity. I begin to embody what it means to be the new human and the new humanity. Then I'm able to cry tears of ecstasy for much wider circles. I cry tears of ecstasy for things I see on the news, for things I read in the newspaper, for a friend that I've never met, but no one's a stranger to me. And I begin to cry tears of ecstasy for, for reality itself. I feel, right? I'm inspired by the chant of reality itself. I'm inspired by the pulse, the throb, of a tumescent reality awake in every second. I'm always doing a kind of psychedelic journey. And in this psychedelic journey, it's lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and I see dazzling images coming at me. And often, you know, a person will do a journey and a certain kind of journey, let's say a psychedelic journey, if it's done in a kind of guided and an appropriate way. And if you take it with with people who really understand deeply the path, you can actually see an incredible array, right, of reality. But then if you really understand what's happening, because actually the medicine, right, the psychedelic medicine needs the Dharma, just like the Dharma needs the expanse of the medicine. If you really understand and you don't get lost, which is why generally, right, I don't suggest journeying because both for the guides and the participants, it's actually quite easy to get lost because medicine doesn't work without Dharma. But if you actually find your way and you actually see this kind of dazzling cacophonies of reality, you actually realize that those dazzling cacophonies of reality are actually the true nature of the reality that you actually inhabit. That if you actually were able to visualize and to feel what actually lives between you and the next person, between you and the tree, 
right, between you and the atmosphere, you would see a dazzling cacophony, right, of electromagnetic waves, right, of gravitational fluctuation, right, of particles, right, of every kind and form that are moving in the space of mirror neurons weaving webs, invisible lines of connection and intimacy every place and everywhere. You would think, oh my God, oh my God, you would think, oh my, you would be say, you'd be blown away by the rapture of the fullness around you and the unimaginable subtle beauty of dazzling inner penetration that's actually the truth of reality right in front of you, the ecstasy of reality disclosed naked in front of you. And you would realize that actually this is the journey right now. This is the journey right now. This is the journey, right? This is the journey. It's right here. It's right here. It's right here, right? And it's, it's so fully awake, so fully alive. And you'd be able to cry tears of ecstasy, literally for reality itself, okay? So the Dharma, the Dharma is the psychedelics of reality. The Dharma takes us into, right, the inner quality of reality itself so that I can actually evolve my tears. That's the evolution of tears. Right, the evolution of tears right, is my capacity to cry ecstatically by meeting the unimaginable fullness of the presence of quite literally this very moment right now, where I'm actually experiencing myself as being breathed by reality I'm aware of everything happening all around me and I experience myself as the very center of the whole thing, even as I know that you're the very center of the whole thing at the same time. So I've actually entered the field. The field has, if I can use a term from contemporary science, the field has multiple centers. We're all multiple centers of the field and it's actually happening literally right now, this very second. So as we gather from around the world, and as you feel right, the, the cables of connection, both in the exterior and the interior, right, binding us and weaving us together, as our hearts begin to beat in a synchronous beat, and we actually open our hearts, we cry. Because how could you not cry at that dazzling beauty? Right? We live in a world of outrageous beauty and the only response to outrageous beauty is outrageous love. And outrageous love always cries tears of ecstasy. And that's the evolution of tears. And I'm actually able to cry in a much wider way. I move beyond right, the narrow confines of my separate self. I begin to then cry from the place of my unique self. I'm a unique expression of the field. I'm in the unique self symphony, which means I'm actually listening to the field. So I don't experience myself as a separate self sitting in my little box and saying, did one mountain entertain me? No, I'm saying, oh my God, I'm part of this revolution. I'm part of this planetary awakening and love through unique self symphonies that my, my beloved Barb Marks Hubbard and I have talked about every week, one way or the other, and we've all talked about it, right? I'm actually playing my instrument in the symphony and I can see the notes of music. And I literally see everyone around me as a note of music. And I see the Dharma as music, right? It's the music of the interior dance of reality, which guides the exteriors. And then I say, hallelujah, right? That's the evolution of tears. That's the evolution of tears on the side of joy on the side of delight on the side of ecstasy. And then there's the evolution of tears on the side of, of pain. Right, of unbearable heartbreak. And I'm actually able to evolve my tears. I don't only cry for my own, for my own loves, for which I should cry, for my loves won and my loves lost and, and the shatterings of love, right? Because any, any true love will experience sometimes in this lifetime a shattering. Sometimes there's a love that's true and it's deep and it's beautiful and it's real. 
but it doesn't have a temple. Right? Every love has its temple. Every truth has its temple. And sometimes we can't quite find the temple for that love. And so we cry. We cry, not that the love has been broken, but that, that it didn't have in this world or at this time, it didn't have a temple. Okay, so we, we feel that pain. And we feel that pain personally. And to be able to feel that pain personally is a great, a great quality of an outrageous lover. But then, then we expand, right? We don't, we actually, we don't locate ourselves only in those tears. We actually enter into the depth of our personal tears. And those personal tears become our chariot. We literally ride those tears into the wider tears, the tears of those who I, who I don't know or I do know and I barely pay attention to. And I begin to actually feel the pathos of other people's pain. Because intimacy means feel me feeling you and feel you feeling me, right? And feel me feeling you feeling me and feel me feeling you feeling me, right? But not just between me and you, the particular localized beloveds, but I begin to feel beyond my immediate circle. And I begin to feel wider and wider circles, right? Of intimate resonance with the heartbreak, with the breakdown, with the collapse. And then, then I feel into the whole thing and I feel into existential risk and I feel into the potential death of humanity and I, I feel into the potential death of our humanity and I stop doing business as usual and I stop being really busy in kind of this new age human potential addiction to another program and to another modality. Can I get another program and another modality? Right? It's the new, new age opioid crisis of modalities and programs, right? I stop being so busy and I deepen, right? I deepen my monogamy, right? I deepen my monogamy, but what I mean is my primary depth commitment, right? To actually being in this revolution and understanding that the only response that will actually shift to the future, the only genuine response to the meta crisis, right? is not a, an infrastructure response, although that's necessary. We need to rebuild certain infrastructures that are critical. It's not just a social structure response, which is laws and social covenants, although some of that stuff is completely critical. But it's actually a superstructure response, which means we've got to tell a new story of value and we lay down our lives, as da Vinci did and Ficinio did in the Renaissance, to actually tell that new story because we know that that's what's going to heal suffering. That's the one thing that's going to allow us not to collapse. And if we do collapse partially, that's what's going to rebuild us the next day. Do you get that? We're building, we're enacting, we're activating the new story, not only to avoid the collapse, but to actually rebuild when parts of the system do collapse. What are the codes through which we'll rebuild the new world? Right, wow, right, what are those codes? So we're writing those codes now together here. Can you feel that? We're writing those codes now together here. And the overwhelming moral imperative of this moment is to tell this new story. To tell this new story, right, to avert all the dimensions of the collapse that we can legitimately avert. And we're gonna spend the next 10 years writing that story and telling that story and delivering that story into culture. And I'm actually down here. You can see my background's different this week. And Terry Nelson always tells me when I'm in a different place, share with people that your background's different. My background is different this week. I'm down here in Austin, all right, with my friend Aubrey. And we're, we're doing some deep work on trying to vision into what the next stages would be. And we're recording some podcasts, right, about, you know, the, the next stage of the vision. We actually want to record this year you know, 12 podcasts, three, you know, four sets of three podcasts each, which actually begin to tell to the broader public the new story. But that new story comes from here. It comes from us. It comes from one mountain. It comes from our commitment. It comes from our love. It comes from our circle of intimacy and influence. It comes from us showing up week after week for each other and with each other in this kind of profound and, and beautiful, right, and kind of stunning monogamy, Right? Right? It's a monogamous polyamory, right? Meaning, meaning, right? Of course, we, we can dance at more than one wedding, 
And of course, we should, we, should, we should take different dimensions and pieces appropriately from different places and, and, and have them be part of us and, and give of ourselves. But in the end, we understand right, that the only direct hit, episode six, the third movie, episode six, Star Wars, the most watched movie, right? The only, the only thing that takes down the culture of death, the Death Star, is a direct hit. And a direct hit comes from one place and one place only. Actually enacting, activating, right? A new story of value, right? Living that story, articulating first values and first principles, embedded in a story of value. Yeah, that's what we're here to do. Yeah, that's what we're here to do. Oh my God. Oh my God, what a great, you know, honor. What an insane pleasure, right? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. And here's the thing, right? The weakness, you know, of polyamory always is, right? And when I say polyamory, I don't mean particularly sexual polyamory, although it's true there as well, right? But the weakness of polyamory, of always loving a new person, is that you're not really loving. You're just engaged in the pseudo eros, right, of a new modality, the pseudo eros of a new body the pseudo eros of a new place, the pseudo eros of a new song, the pseudo eros of a new chant. And newness is beautiful. And we should, right, engage, right? We should love widely and broadly. But polyamory has always got to be monogamous, right? It's the paradox, not a contradiction. There's a monogamous polyamory, right? And a monogamous polyamory means I've got to actually, at the same time, be deeply at home, right? At home. Right? We're here at home in One Mountain, and, and we, we actually say the Dharma every week. We say it in a different way. Right? We approach it through a different door. We deepen the Dharma in all sorts of ways and all sorts of nuances. We add new chapters to the Dharma. But in the end, we're here, and we're here every week. And that's the strength of the great traditions, right? that the New Age world, that the human potential world Right, that the San Francisco kind of Portland, you know, kind of that world and in all of its recensions in Europe and in Australia, right, and in England, right, in the United States and in, in, in other, other parts of the world hasn't yet been able to replicate, which is why it hasn't had power, because everyone's dilettanting, everyone's running from place to place, right, and the opioid epidemic of new modalities and new experiences, right, and, and that's a kind of superficiality when it becomes addictive, when it actually prevents me from dropping in, right, into depth. And the opposite of the holy is not the unholy. We've said it so many times. The opposite of the holy, my friends, is the superficial, right? right? Depth is the holy. And depth is, is I sing the same thing again and again, but each time it's, it's deeper, right? It's not that I saw you naked once, or twice, or three times, or four times, or five times, and we're over. No, it's that I actually, I'm blown away by your naked shoulder. I'm blown away by your naked belly because I always see you with fresh eyes. That's how we chant. That's how we do on mountain. It's always with fresh eyes, right? Soft eyes, fresh eyes. So we're about to pray, and we're about to, to play that song by Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah. Right, it's about the holy and broken hallelujah. And we're, we're going we're gonna to read the evolutionary love code, and then we're going to pray. Then we're going to talk about the evolutionary love code and our evolutionary sense making. Right, so I'm going to start with, we're going to turn to David with mad delight. He's going to resonate for us the code of this week. Then we're going to turn to prayer. We're going to say when David finishes the code, I'm just going to say a word about prayer. Then I'm going to invite myself, if I can, with your permission, and invite you to step into this prayer like we never have before, right? And to actually open up the field of prayer, which is the field of the intimate universe, to turn to the divine whose new name, the new name of God is the infinite intimate, right? God who's the infinity of intimacy, who knows our name, who holds us in the holy and broken hallelujah. And part of reweaving the source code of consciousness and culture and telling the new story of value is the realization we're not in this alone. And so we can't have techno-feudalist Thanos solutions, if I can borrow the image of Thanos from the last Avengers movie, right? Thanos, who's a singularity university technocrat, 
right, who comes up with solutions to existential risk that kill half of humanity and that downgrade right, the essential quality of humanity of the rest of the people left alive. But he's doing that because that's the way to save humanity. No, no, no. That's the Thanos solutions are without first values and without first principles, and most importantly, without partnership with God. Right? When, the, when God's dethroned, which means we step out of the field of the Tao, God means the Tao, the field of value. When we step out of the field of value, when we step out of the Tao, and then we seek solutions to existential risk, then our solutions become the great tragedy itself. Our solutions themselves become the fulfillment of existential risk. We seek to heal existential risk and our solutions for its healing create the destruction. That's the Thanos image and culture, which comes from the end of the Avengers movie, right? Who wants to get the infinity stones in order to, in one instant, painlessly as it were, kill half of humanity to save the rest. Now, that not only comes from a human hebrus, a Thanos hebrus, that isn't partnered with the divine, that's not in search of the divine, that doesn't feel the divine in search of humanity. No, we're partnering with the divine, which means we're partnering with first values and we're partnering with first principles, right? And we're partnering in a, a story of value. And we're in the Song of Solomon, which says, Anila do diva do dili, I am for my beloved. And my beloved is for me, right? Oh my God, right? Oh my God, what a joy, right? What a delight. So David's gonna resonate the code and then Taylor's gonna take us into, right? The, the holy and the broken, hallelujah. And we're gonna pray together, right? We're gonna invite the partner to pray with us, right? And then we'll, we'll do some evolutionary sense making. Right? And we're gonna go through, right? Right, really today, before we finish today, we're gonna go through the 10 principles of outrageous love what we committed to today. We've done six of them already. We'll review those and then we'll get to the last four and we'll see something just so dazzling, so beautiful, which, which opens up so much possibility right? because that's what we are. We are at one mountain. We're, we're living and we're breathing the divine field. And so we are the evolutionary impulse. We are right, the possibility of possibility. And with great joy and delight, I turn my word to David to resonate the code. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Here's the code. It's in the chat box, so you can follow along with me. Why do we not act to heal outrageous pain? It's not often, as it's suggested, because we do not feel the pain. Rather, it's because we feel the pain so intensely and don't know how to heal it. In the gap, between our ability to feel the pain and our ability to heal the pain, we close our hearts. Therefore, the only way to open our hearts is to close the gap. We close the gap by restoring our capacity to heal the pain, thus allowing us to take the first step toward healing to feel the pain. The precise method of closing the gap is to realize that it's not ours to heal the whole thing. It's ours to heal the pain that is uniquely ours to address in our unique circle of intimacy and influence. To be a unique self is to be a unique healer. That's to say, the healer of the pain that is yours to heal. We are all healers. And with that, I turn my word to you, beloved Mark, to bring us into prayer. Thank you, thank you. And I just, you know, David, a gorgeous resonance, brother. And I just want to say just one thing. I want to just pick up one sense, you know, as, as we kind of go into prayer. I want to just also get that sentence that we said earlier, okay? Because I, I don't want to lose it, right? Which is, and I, I know I'm, I'm harking back, but I want, to, I want to make sure we capture that sentence. You know, we live in a world today where there's an enormous amount of medicine journeying. Have you noticed that? Right? Once Steve Jobs wrote in his, his autobiography about him actually doing medicine journeys, different forms of psychedelic journey, and actually Jobs wouldn't actually hire someone at Apple who hadn't done kind of some dimension of journeying. So journeying went from the fringes to the center of culture. The problem with journeying is, is that by itself, it can be neutral and even dangerous. Right? Neutral meaning when you go inside, depending on what kind of plant right, you're, you're on, what kind of ride you're on, right? that ride inside 
doesn't work. It doesn't get you home without Dharma, right? Medicine needs Dharma, right? right? And Dharma needs medicine. And, and Dharma needs medicine means Dharma means yoga. Dharma needs yoga. And yoga can be prayer and yoga can be chant and yoga can be meditation and yoga can be writing, sacred writing. Aurobindo's great yoga, great medicine was he wrote, right? And yoga can be actually an occasional journey, right? With medicine, right? But Dharma needs yoga, yoga needs Dharma. Dharma needs medicine, medicine needs Dharma. You can't do psychedelics, right? Or any other kind of yogic practice without Dharma because then it becomes a kind of cultivation of a state experience. And that state experience by itself is neutral. There's a reason why there were not a few practiced Zen monks as kamikaze pilots for Japan right, in World War II. They had cultivated their journeys, their medicine journeys, their state experiences. But if those state experiences are not mediated through the Dharma, through an understanding of the amorous cosmos, of the amorous cosmos that lives in me, right, through first principles, right, and first values, then the medicine becomes poison. The medicine even can become a lake of poison, right? And at the same time, the Dharma always needs the yoga, it means the Dharma always needs to be alive. I always need to feel it in my spirit, in my soul, in my body. Otherwise, the Dharma gradually ossifies, it gradually petrifies, it becomes scary, the Dharma becomes dogma, right? So the Dharma needs the medicine, the medicine needs the Dharma. And one of the most powerful medicines is to pray, right? To pray is a psychedelic journey, that's what it is, right? I step inside, I feel, I train myself to feel to arouse myself, to feel the field of the infinity of, it, of intimacy, right? And I access the holy and broken hallelujah that lives in me and I can feel her holding me and, and touching me and gracing me and in kissing my holy and broken hallelujah and kissing my broken heart. And I show up deeper and deeper to tell the new story, to be the new story, to articulate the new story of value. And I ask her, I ask her, help me, help me be healthy. A dear and close friend of mine, right, and a friend of ours, right, just, just, just called me and said she had Parkinson's. And I'm like, wow, that's a big deal, right? Dear friend of mine, personal friend of mine, right? Y'all don't know her, right? But right, just, oh my God, right? So I'm praying for her and she's going to be good. She's going to be fine. She's going to walk through it. You can walk through Parkinson's these days. There's, there's actually that real capacity, right? If, if you, if you really approach it with, with divine grace. And there's, there's new openings in that. And so I have great hope for it. Right, so we pray, we pray for our friends that are sick and the parts of ourselves that, that feel sick. Right, and we pay for, for those who have need of physical healing and need of financial healing and need of, of heart healing. Right, we pray for all of it. And we pray for the whole thing. That's the evolution of tears. Right, we cry for the whole thing. And we feel our joy and we feel the joy of the whole thing. That's the holy and the broken, hallelujah. So take us inside. Let's track this right in our hearts and let it track in our hearts. And let's pray like we never have before. And then as, as we hear right the chant from Leonard, let's write our prayers asking for everything, ask for everything you need. Because prayer is about the dignity. Prayer affirms the dignity of personal need. That's what evolution is. Evolution is love in action, responding to need. That's what evolution is. I mean, the dignity of personal need. That is what prayer is about. Prayer affirms the dignity of personal need and prayer tells me what I need. It reminds me of what I need. It forces me to clarify what I need. So pray, let's pray together. Let's hold hands with she. Let's ask, ask for everything. Let's ask for everything. So take us inside, beloved. All right, let's go in the holy, and the broken hallelujah. It's so good to be with you, everyone. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the battle king composing, hallelujah.
I just want to feel that with you, okay? Right, as we read the prayers, and just before I read the prayers, I just want to just notice something, right? Whenever you go to an act of revolution, there's someone who's going to cry niggers, right? Everyone saw in the chat box, right? Someone showed up at one mountain, right? And just screamed, hey, and we don't know who the person was, right? And that's, that's a tragedy. Because actually what's happening all over the web, right, is whoever Randy Miller was, whoever did that, right, it's actually those voices that are dominating the threads, right, and the chat rooms, right, it's voices actually of polarization, right, it's voices of hatred. And we have to actually drown out those voices. Right? We have to be a revolution of outrageous love. And so, Randy Miller, that's not okay. And whoever you are, I am sorry for the tragedy of your life. But I call you right, to know and to feel your goodness and to feel right, the joy that lives in you and to feel the pain and not let that pain become poison. And I call you to your potency. And I call you to your poignancy and I call you to your power because when you come and throw a bomb that says nigger in a chat box of love, you're not powerful. You're powerless and you're not poignant. You're pathetic and you're not potent. You're impotent. 
And so let's stand right for the voices of love, right? And let's, let's feel not the voices of polarization, right? But the voices of potency. Oh my God. Let's just take a look at the chat box and let's read. Okay. Oh my God. Right. Let's, let's just look at a couple of prayers and just feel a couple of the prayers. Right. I pray that tears says Margie kiss the cheeks of those most influential and powerful. Yes, Margie and beloved Margie, right? You are awesome and you're a rock star and you know what it is? We are actually among the most influential and powerful, right? Because all the places you think are influential actually are peddling pseudo eros, but what's actually going to impact the source code and evolve the source code of consciousness and culture and change the very superstructure of reality, which is a story of value in which we live. That's us. That's us. It's actually, it's hard to, to kind of take that seriously, right? We run away from our own power when actually we are the influential and powerful. Let me ask you a question. Okay. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to just do a little thought experiment for a second. Margie and I, oh, we're going to do it. Margie and I are going to do this with everyone. It's you're in Jerusalem and it's the moment of the crucifixion. It's literally the moment of the crucifixion that, that epic moment, brother David in Christianity, right? I also have a brother David in my life. I'm very close to brother David Stendhal Rast, my friend who's a, a Trappist monk, a, a Jesuit who's, you know, now 96. He just sent me a message literally a few days ago, but I have a young brother David with me here also. So you always need a brother David. Okay. So that, that moment of the crucifixion and in Jerusalem, who is powerful? So there's all the influential and powerful in Jerusalem of that moment. But how many of us have any idea who those people were? We haven't heard a, a word about them. We don't know who they are. Their lives, their power was illusory. It was impotent power. It was the power, right, of pseudo eros, not the power of eros. And yet that little band of outrageous lovers that gathered around the cross, right, at the moment of the crucifixion, when eros itself was being murdered, we know who they are. We know every one of them. We know every move they made, every breath they took. Right? And we honor those breaths because those were the breaths of the powerful. We think we know who's influential and powerful, right? But we're actually deflecting because actually, right, the powerful, that's us, right? That's us, my friends. Do you get that? That's us, right? We're the powerful, right? We're the influential and powerful. And that's an incredible realization. All right, Terry Nelson, right, I pray that my big brother Warren feel loved and held as he battles Parkinson's. And I saw Terry. Terry and I saw each other a couple of days ago. We, we stole some time right, to give each other a hug, right? All right. It was so good to see you, Terry. All right. I pray for Warren so deeply, right? Jerry Roback, welcome, all right? I too received the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease two days ago. And, and I am the power of love, right? Walking in my own healing, live the love. Jerry, right? Jerry, brother. Oh my God, right? Oh my God. Right? I just found out two days ago, my friend, we had a dial di diagnosis of Parkinson and Jerry, you're my friend. All right, so we're, we're, now I've got two friends, right? So I'll get the two of you together and just blow this away, Jerry. Walk through this strong and thank you. And we're with you like, oh my God, are we with you? Oh my God, right? Yes, right? We're praying for Warren. We're knowing that we're the influential and the powerful, right? We're, we're, we're here. We're here together. Okay. So let's look at our code. Let's, let's do our evolutionary sense making. Let's do it like we've never done it before. And maybe somebody could, if you're up for it, to put our code there again, that David resonated so beautifully, right? So why do we not heal outrageous pain? So let's just, let's go through 10 steps. Here we go. Are we ready, everybody? Let's go through these 10 steps. Let's see if we can get this like really, really, really clear. So the first step is, right? The first step is I live in a world, we live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. That's step one. And I'm recapitulating here. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to just go through it just very simply, very gently in six or seven minutes. We can see all 10 pieces in there. They're stunningly beautiful. Okay. So we begin. We live in a world of outrageous pain. We don't deny the pain. We don't explain the pain away. We don't say the pain's an illusion. We don't say the pain is a result of some sin we've done for which we deserve punishment. 
We don't do the new age version of that when we say we attracted the pain into our life. We actually stand before outrageous pain and we don't try and give answers. You can't answer the pain. There are questions that don't have an answer. So therefore we say we live in a world of outrageous pain. We say the only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. It's not an answer that nullifies the question. It's a response. We respond to outrageous pain by protesting. We protest because we know we live in a field of outrageous love. So pain is a violation of outrageous love. And we respond with outrageous love by moving to heal the pain, by moving to transmute the pain, to transform the pain. We are unique incarnations. We are lived as love. We are outrageous love in action, right? We are evolution and evolution is love in action. We are unique incarnations of evolution. So we are unique incarnations of love and action individually and together as unique self symphony. Okay. What does an outrageous love word mean? What does that word mean? By outrageous love, we mean not ordinary love, but love, which is the heart of existence itself. Ordinary love is the sense that love is a mere human creation. It's a mere human contrivance. And it's a social construction of reality. We're saying, no, 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 love is not mere human sentiment. Love is the heart of existence itself. And so who are we? We're unique incarnations of outrageous love. That's what it means to be a unique self. So what does an outrageous lover do? What does an outrageous lover do? So first we started with, we live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response is outrageous love. We live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response is outrageous love. One, two. We made the distinction between ordinary love and outrageous love. Three, we ask, what does an outrageous lover do? An outrageous lover is lived as love. And what does it mean to be lived as love? It means the outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love, right? That's our great crime. We're committing the crime of outrageous love. And I'm calling it a crime because it's breaking. It's outrageous. It breaks the boundaries of the proprieties of ego, of not giving too much, of, of being closed, right? Of, of giving of my heart, but not of my funds, because those are only for me, right? You know who a person really is. You know who a person is by who they are when they're scared, by who they are in sexing, and by who they are with their money. Those are the three ways you know a person, right? So my money's not mine, right? I give my money and I pour funds. I've done that my whole life. Right? It's all we need. You got to pour funds right into your holy circle, right? The notion that there's actually just individual people and everyone should do, you know, self-commodify and get a particular job in a particular way and, and function, right? And that self-commodified world is not exactly right. We need to move in the world as bands of outrageous lovers. And in those bands, we all have different roles. We all have to give everything. And for some people, right, commodifying and monetizing works well. And for other people, it doesn't. So we have to move down the field and take care of each other in a thousand ways together, right? So to commit outrageous acts of love, those are our crimes of outrageous love because they're outrageous. They break the boundary of the conventional, of what's conventionally acceptable in the myth of separation. And I become an outrageous lover. I'm filled with that sense of outrage against contraction, right? And outrageous joy, right? So we commit our outrageous acts of love. Right? Four, which outrageous acts of love should we commit? That's our question. Those that are a function of our unique self. And every person is a unique incarnation of outrageous love. And every person has unique outrageous acts of love to commit. So I commit the outrageous acts of love that are a function of my unique self. And, and which ones are those? Right? Number five, those are the outrageous acts of love that address a unique need that needs healing in my unique circle of intimacy and influence. And I'm not here by mistake. The intimate universe allured me into this place where I am with these people in this life and this situation and this dynamic. I came here through the allurement of reality that drew me here and speaking and addressing my unique circle of intimacy and influence. That's where I commit my outrageous acts of love. And as such, number six, I begin to play my instrument because my outrageous acts of love are my instrument. I begin to play my instrument in the unique self symphony. That's what it means to be alive. Now seven, why isn't everyone doing it? Right? 
Why isn't everyone moving to heal the outrageous pain, right? And this is our code. And it's not, as is often suggested by so many spiritual teachers, because we're locked in our ego, because we don't feel the pain. And we're, so, we're too busy with our lives, we don't feel the pain, so we don't actually respond, right? We actually turn away. That's actually not true for so many of us. It's actually deeper. And number eight, actually, we do feel the pain. We allowed ourselves at one moment to feel the pain and we felt it so acutely, right? So painfully, right? So immensely that we couldn't bear it. It became unbearable in some essential way. And so we turned away because we could feel the pain, but we didn't know how to heal the pain. And in the gap between our ability to feel the pain and our ability to heal the pain, we turned away, we closed our hearts, right? So we don't close our hearts. We didn't close our hearts because we were lost in a kind of narcissistic ego. We closed our hearts because at what point we opened our hearts, we were fully open, we felt it, but we felt impotent to heal it. And the gap between our ability to feel the pain and our ability to heal the pain was unbearable. So in that gap, we closed our hearts. So number nine, so what do we have to do to open our hearts, my friends? How do we open hearts? So we open our hearts, this is our code, we open our hearts by closing the gap. We close the gap between our ability to feel the pain and our ability to heal the pain, right? And what number are we at? What number was that, friends? What number? Anybody got a number? What number was that? That was nine, okay? So now number 10, how do we close that gap? We close that gap by giving up the narcissistic delusion of the ego that I myself can or must heal the whole thing. It's not mine to heal the whole thing. It's mine to feel the whole thing. What's mine to heal is the unique need that can be personally addressed by my capacities and my gifts in my unique circle of intimacy and influence. And what we do is we actually turn away from healing the unique need in my unique circle of intimacy and influence because I can't heal the whole thing. It's a deceptive strategy. No, I've got to feel the whole thing. And then I've got to turn to my neighborhood, to my circle, right? To my community, if I'm privileged to have a community which is actually engaged in the revolution directly, wow, we get to be the privileged and the powerful, right? Like, oh my God, right? Let's just feel that, right, friends? Let's just feel that. Let's just feel that so beautiful, right? So beautiful. I can actually heal the pain that's mine to heal in my circle. And that makes me powerful again. Do you get that? That makes me powerful again. All of a sudden I'm powerful again. I'm powerful because I'm actually living my unique self. I'm addressing the unique pain in my unique circle of intimacy and influence. And that's what's mine to do. And when, when I do that and I experience my power again, my heart opens again and I can feel more than I ever did. And when I feel more than I ever did, it actually fills me up with even more power and expands my potency and I can heal wider and wider circles. That's the Dharma and that's the yoga. First, I have to throw off that notion that it's all mine to heal. It's not all mine to heal. That's a narcissistic delusion of the ego. It's mine to feel the whole thing. That's the evolution of tears. The evolution of tears, I can not only feel my pain, I can actually feel the outrageous pain of the world. And then I turn to my unique circle of intimacy and influence and I act there heroically, outrageously, committing my crimes, right? Meaning my crimes, meaning my great and gorgeous acts. They're crimes in the sense they're crimes against contraction. They're crimes against smallness. They're crimes against, right, pseudo conventions, right, that keep us locked in our impotence, right? We have to be outrageous. I commit my outrageous acts of love addressing the unique need in my unique circle of intimacy and influence. Oh my God, right? Can you feel that, my friends? Right? Oh my God, how gorgeous, right? Right, how gorgeous, right? 
Oh my God. Right? All the way. All the way. Can you feel that? Wow. Wow. How gorgeous indeed. Right? How gorgeous indeed. What an honor, my friends. It's a crazy honor to be with you. It's a crazy honor to be part of our band of outrageous lovers. It's a crazy honor to be articulating together these evolutionary love codes and, and downloading them into the source codes of culture. It's a crazy honor to love each other. It's a crazy honor to be monogamously polyamorous with you, right? to be in the depth of a monogamy. It's a crazy honor to be the Dharma for the medicine, right? Wow. Welcome, Jerry, right? Welcome, welcome. I turn the word to you, Krista, right? Crazy, crazy delight and honor to be here together. Oh my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Krista. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Margofni, and thank you and thank us all for placing our attention here on the evolution of love. I can feel our presence um, in the chat box, our presence resonating the Dharma, our presence giving our attention to the Dharma here together. And as Mark is speaking about this, we are the band of outrageous lovers. We are really here doing it, activating it, enacting it, becoming it together, becoming the new story together. So as we're feeling that, we can also begin to feel how does this outrageous love want to move in each and every one of us uniquely? So the question is, what is your unique, outrageous act of love that is yours to commit and yours alone? And maybe that's a beautiful question that we can actually take with, with us um, into the week. What would an outrageous lover do in every situation, in every place we come, in every unique corner of the world that we are, we can ask that question, what would an outrageous lover do? And that is a beautiful way to practice together. And the second way that we practice together in outrageous love is by writing outrageous love letters and that is a practice that can deepen and deepen and deepen but one way that we can all get started is by just writing them and we can write outrageous love letters to ourselves we can write it to the cosmos we can write it to our mother to our best friend even to a flower or to an apple if you're if you have enough inspiration um, and the practice is to exaggerate until you are accurate so to take a moment with yourself and really you can even listen to this replay you can read through this these steps again and feel the resonance of outrageous love um, moving in you and what from that place how would you speak what would you write what would you say so that is our practice and in our community in this band of outrageous lovers we actually write these letters to each other all the time and every note is actually an outrageous love note so in our work together, as we are creative together, it's never random and it's never casual. It's actually always outrageous. And that way we're constantly pouring outrageous love into each other and into the center of this revolution. So that's the invitation for today to just take one step closer, step onto the dance floor and become a player in this field because it's just delicious to be working and co-creating and loving our way to enlightenment as the dharma says so you're welcome 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 to play your unique instrument in the symphony as your heart desires that one way to do that of course is by becoming a member and I just want to celebrate that so many people, um, since the last weeks, we started speaking about um, the evolutionary sense-making books. And that is our big projects that we're going to be working on together this year. And there's still a um, place for you to step into editing. If you desire to do so, please write me an email. Um, I'm sure Jamie will help me put my email in the chat box right now. So you can participate in that by editing. But also, we ask everyone to actually step up um, as much as you can. And so many people did that by making a one-time donation, but also many people writing us um, asking, can, can I up level my um, monthly contribution from $25 to $50, from $50 to $100. So whatever you can do, please give as much as you can, because this revolution is ours to do together. No one is here to get rich. This isn't a company where we're trying to sell each other things we are in this revolution together and we all give as much as we can so please become a member and um as a member you also get 
access to nine beautiful self-study courses and Christina shared it in the beginning. We also have an amazing uh, re weekly writing group happening every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And there's just so many places to meet each other, to hang out with each other, and just to outrageously love each other. So welcome, 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 welcome to join, to participate, to step in. And now we close, as we do every week, with a beautiful, outrageous love dance song. So Christina will turn on some music. And while we are listening to the music, we will invite everyone to, as it's technically called, promote as panelists. And if you click OK, you will be able to turn on your video. And I really, really do hope that you will do that so we can see each other on the other side on the screen and say hello and, and just wave each other goodbye into well the nights in holland it is but into your beautiful sunday so christina please take us inside thank you so much <laughs> 